So, uh, guys, I would like to introduce uh, Guilherme Mesqua. He is a associate professor and director of ocular surface service in the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, we we had some some I, I saw him some videos that you have very interesting, and he will share his uh, presentation with us. Uh, please, Dr. Guillermo. Okay, thank you very much, Takeshi. It's a, a, an honor. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I uh, I'm going to give my lecture in English. It's, Spanish is my first first language, but uh, I'll try to go slow. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free. I am a cornea specialist. Uh, I also do a lot of cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is the surgery I do the most. And uh, I have a fellowship in uveitis also. So I do a lot of the cataracts that the uveitis service sends me and also the radiation oncology, sorry, the on ophthalmology oncology service from our hospital sends me a lot of the cataracts. Are you able to see the slide here? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna start uh, with the with the boring part of the lecture first, and then we'll go to lec we'll go to uh, videos. And if at any point you have, uh, I'll be checking my WhatsApp. Or if they're gonna send me questions, um, I'll be happy to answer. So, you know, cataract surgery uh, in the past uh, for specifically talking of inflammatory conditions of the eye was something that no one wanted to do. It was uh, associated with very bad outcomes. There was no good medications to control the inflammation. The surgical techniques were not as delicate as now. And for this reason, there's publications that show, like you can see this, this review paper uh, from, um, from years ago. It says that, you know, it was, uh, not, uh, that presence of chronic uveitis is known to be hardest, and the surgery pro procedure may exacerbate the inflammation. And so people didn't want to do it. As we, as the steroids became more available, and in different ways to administer intravenous, subtenons, intracameral, intravitreal, uh, and uh, the understanding of control of the inflammation before the surgery, uh, the results are starting to get a lot better. Uh, even in patients that had inflammation uh, yeah, in the 90s, uh, they were starting to use intraocular lenses because uh, that was something that was prohibited. That you should not use an intraocular lens in a patient that has inflammation because of uh, uh, associated complications so such as uh, membrane formation and um, adhesions with the iris, etc. So, um, the group of Dr. Foster started to started to understand the role of controlling inflammation, and this is something that I'm going to be repeating again and again and again for the residents. It's very important that you you control the inflammation before you jump into the surgery. Even in pediatric patients, um, uh, we started to get better outcomes. Now, for the interest of this lecture, I'm going to emphasize most of what I'm going to say is going to be on adult patients because pediatric. UBD cataract surgery is a complete different uh, animal. We it, it it it's it behaves different. It should be approached different. In these patients, most of them they need to have a very aggressive vitrectomy uh, um, for the results to be um, uh, reasonable or, or for good results. Now, if you look at this more recent meta-analysis by the group of uh, John Kempen up in the northeast of the United States, um, he does a lot of very good uh, uveitis clinical trials. He did a meta-analysis where he looked at many, many uh, papers on uveitic cataracts, and uh, pretty much what it shows that if you follow the guidelines, um, the results of cataract surgery is using an acrylic foldable IOL with a small incision and good control of the inflammation, uh, cataract surgery will offer very good results. With he, 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 his conclusion was cataract surgery in eyes with uveitis can result in normal or near normal visual acuity in the majority of the cases. And these are patients that uh, have a well-controlled uveitis with no macular edema and, not, and no advanced glaucoma. So it's very important to uh, take that into consideration. So this is also a very important slide because um, to do routine cataract surgery in a patient with active or uncontrolled uveitis will be an irresponsible, not just medically irresponsible, but also medical legal. 
uh, you can get in trouble by doing uh, this type of surgeries in patients that are not well controlled. There are certain exceptions. Uh, when a patient has phaco antigenic uveitis, well, the reason of the of the uveitis is the the phaco antigenic component, so that has to be clear and surgery is indicated. Anytime there is an important need uh, for visualization of the posterior segment, um, uh, even if the patient is inflamed, but if it's important to visualize, if there's a suspicion for uh, posterior segment lesions or tumors, etc., it has to be done. And uh, anytime that the inflammation is well controlled for a minimum of two to three months, then you can go ahead and do it. As we go into the presentations, I'm going to go from early on until you start seeing the patient, making the diagnosis, then how do we control the inflammation, what are we going to use, then we're going to go through the surgery, and then we're going to go to control of the post-op inflammation. So in a patient with the uveitis, it's very important that we have a very good diagnosis or the best diagnosis available. Um, you have to establish at least a syndrome if it's an infectious uveitis versus an autoimmune uveitis or idiopathic uveitis. Um, that way you can offer a prognosis to the patient because it's very different that if you're going to do cataract surgery in a patient with Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis versus a patient that has a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis related cataract. Those patients have very different uveitis uh, and the control of the inflammation is going to be um, uh, very different. Uh, so you also have to take into consideration the visual outcome uh, and talk to the family and talk to the patient uh, because patients think that once they take the cataract out, then they're going to have a perfect vision. And then a lot of these patients have comorbidities such as secondary glaucoma, macular edema, retinopathy, etc. So it's very important to, to study that. And you know, we have to remind ourselves that we are physicians and the proper studies and review of systems needs to be documented to make sure um, that the uveitis is well diagnosed. Once we have the diagnosis uh, of the uveitis, we need to control the inflammation and the vast majority of the uveitis are autoimmune. If it's an, infl if it, if it's an infectious uveitis, it needs to be treated. Uh, I know you uh, in Brazil are very experienced with toxoplasmosis. Uh, so you have to control the toxoplasmosis and the inflammation. But here, for the control of the inflammation, we want to try to make at least two to three months of, um, of control of no inflammation in order to proceed with scheduling the surgery. The marker for inflammation is going to be cells in the anterior chamber. You want to have no cells. Uh, and flare is something that's going to be present because once in some of the uveitic syndromes, once the aqueous barrier is violated, then you're always going to have flare, even if you control the inflammation. So flare is OK. Uh, cells are not OK. You have to quiet the anterior chamber. And we're going to use corticosteroids and other anti-inflammatories and uh, therapies. Uh, corticosteroids can be used as much as possible, as an ag aggressive as possible, but you have to taper them because if not, you're going to get into uh, problems. So. Dependent, depending on the uveitis, because it's difficult to generalize, we're going to try uh, to uh, use um, topical steroids before the surgery. Uh, we're going to try to do systemic steroids. So normally, I will uh, use a, 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 a IV dose. In, in my case here, we use solumedrol, um, methylprednisolone, uh, and, uh, or you can use oral steroids um, uh, in some of these patients. Uh, um, if it's a patient that's been very, very well controlled, uh, maybe uh, just the use of pre, uh, uh, topical steroids before the surgery and periocular steroids or intravitreal steroids can be enough. But it's important to, um, you know, to know what kind of uveitis you're treating. And this is a very important paper. It's, it's getting to be very old, it's 20 years now, but th this is a guideline on immunosuppressive drugs in patients with ocular inflammatory disorders. There's been many updates in this paper, but this is the original manuscript on the a journal of AJO. And this journal, what, what this journal tells us is that for certain syndromes, this is why it's very important to know what are we treating. For certain syndromes, we know that steroids are not gonna be enough. So. For example, if you're treating a patient with mucous membrane pemphigoid or a necrotizing scleritis, or you have a patient with retinal vasculitis, then you know that the patient is going to need 
uh, more than steroids and is going to need immunomodulatory therapy uh, to control the inflammation before and after the surgery. So if you don't feel comfortable, um, then you have to collaborate with a UBI specialist, with a rheumatologist, with an internal medicine doctor that can help you control. And because of the interest of this talk is not to teach you about uh, these medicines, I'm just going to briefly mention them uh, and then move um, forward. Um, I'm going to check if there's any questions so far. No questions. So uh, in our practice, because I'm a, I'm a UBI specialist, I feel very comfortable using anti-metabolites. These medications are very inexpensive, um, are very uh, are easily available here, in, and they're uh, topical, sorry, they're oral systemic, or they are subcutaneous use. For example, the one that we use the most is methotrexate, and it's used weekly. You can do it orally, uh, or you can inject subcutaneously with a very good uh, safety profile. We use T-cell inhibitors mostly for patients with high-risk corneal transplants, but the ubi service uses for a lot of the patients with posterior segment inflammation. Um, we, are, uh, we like to use Prograf instead of cyclosporine because of the, uh, the side effects. And there are other more aggressive medications such as cyclophosphamide, uh, which are alkyl alkylating agents. And this, this medications we, I, do, I, do, I used to manage it by myself uh, when I prescri prescribe it as tablets, but because of the risk with the medications, I try to do it on the uh, collaboration with a rheumatologist. So you need to have a plan for taking these patients to surgery. Uh, you need to make sure that the eye is quiet. And once we get into surgery, one of the most common scenarios we encounter when we are going to do patients that had inflammation in the eye is that we're going to have a lot of synechia. So the pupil is going to be small. The pupil is going to be fibrotic. So you need to uh, learn how to manage um, the pupil in these patients. And there are many ways to do it. There's hooks, there's rings. You can use um, your own instruments. Uh, like uh, you can use a, a Sinsky hook with a Coglin hook and you can uh, uh, stretch the pupil yourself. Something that we use in the United States very frequently is what we call epi sugar cane. Uh, it was described by Dr. Sugar, um, Dr. Sugar uh, and it's epinephrine with lidocaine. It's a uh, preservative free. It's a compounding pharmacy that makes it for us. And it's an excellent medication because it provides anesthesia and good dilation. Um, so because I do a lot of these cataracts, I feel comfortable to do this sometimes just with this medication. Don't have to use a retrovolva or a perivolvar block. But if you're an early in your training and you don't feel comfortable and you're going to be manipulating iris, I recommend do, doing a perivolvar anesthesia because these patients can be uncomfortable. So this medication works really well. Um, it's inexpensive uh, and uh, easily available for us. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can get something similar in, in Brazil, but here you can see that there was a patient that was not dilating very well, and we can use the drop and expand the pupil just with the pharmacological agent, and then just use your viscoelastic to try to uh, uh, push your pupil and uh, have a, a good exposure for the for the surgery. Um, there's iris hooks. I, I like iris hooks for some of my cases. If I'm going to be doing more than a cataract, if I have to, uh, if I know there's going to be sonular problems, if I know I may have to suture a lens or something like that, uh, I don't like to use intraocular rings. Uh, uh, it can get problematic uh, uh, to fit some of the instruments and the lens, etc. So I like to use high-risk hooks that are inexpensive uh, and easy to put in. Um, they're uh, more time-consuming than than the than the uh, rings, uh, and the, because of that, is the main reason that we use uh, we use um, the, uh, the the expans the expansion rings more than the hooks. Uh, because in the United States, the most of the cost for the surgery is the OR time, not the actual device. So uh, here we're doing a, a case of a, a monocular patient with pediatric glaucoma that has two glaucoma tubes. He's had it for many, many years, and he's now in his 20s. I did a DSEC some years ago. You can see that the DSEC, that DSEC lasted about three to four years, and then it failed. And now, now he has a, a significant cataract. So we did a, a fakic DSEC on uh, fakic endothelial keratoplasty, and now we have to repeat it and do the cataracts. So the visibility is, is, is a challenge. So in this case, in this case, it was dilating well from here, but this 
this part over here had a lot and on the I'm operating temporally. Most of my surgeries I do temporally and uh, uh, with the iris hooks you can uh, select you can select which areas you want to control the iris and uh, you can uh, you can get help with an endo illuminator uh, in cases that have uh, poor visibility and you know, as you're doing your your capsulorexis, your assistant, um, nurse, or your resident or fellow can can help you. And sometimes you can use you can use the 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 light pipe as your second instrument uh, and try to uh, um, get to the case uh, in a safely way. So in these cases, you know you do a large rexis and you try to prolapse because the endothelium is already uh, uh, not working well. Uh, so we prolapse everything anterior, we take the lens out, and then we can put a lens in, uh, injecting the lens and uh, completing with a with a DSEC and have the case uh, done successfully. Uh, this is the patient after the after the surgery. So we I'm a very big fan of the Malugan ring. I don't have uh, any any commercial interest uh, on this. Uh, in fact, I think uh, or our friend Boris is, uh, I, I pay for his Tesla because I've used it so much um, that uh, uh, I think that's how he got it. So, but uh, there are other rings, not just the Malugan ring. There's um, an eye ring, and I know you have others in, in Brazil uh, that we don't have over here, uh, but you can use whatever you feel more comfortable uh, as long as you have good expansion. And this is, I think, the example of the most common uveitic cataract. This is a patient with chronic iridocyclitis idiopathic that had all the labs and everything is uh, negative and there's the uveitis was controlled with topical and periocular medication. The patient didn't need anything systemic. Um, so every time you're going to do the surgeries, you want to you want to plan it well. You want to make sure you do two, sometimes three paracentesis incisions right from the beginning. You want to be breaking all the adhesions with your viscoelastic and then um, do your incision um, again I'm operating temporally this is a, a left eye and um, and uh, sometimes I do uh, if I don't if I don't know what I'm going to encounter on the lens because the pupil was very small uh, I will use a cohesive uh, viscoelastic so I can easily remove it uh, and and then and stain and then put a dispersive viscoelastic to protect the endothelium uh, or you can just inject under the iris the tripen blue. Uh, that way, uh, if the cataract is pretty significant, then you already have uh, good um, visibility with your anterior capsule. Uh, so uh, once you release some of the adhesions, in this case, we are using a Molyugan ring uh, that comes in two sizes, 6.25 and 7 millimeters. Uh, and it depends on uh, what's your preference. Sometimes you don't want to enlarge the pupil so much and cause uh, uh, sphincter tears, etc. So uh, you can use a 6.25 millimeter. Uh, if you're gonna uh, need to do more than the cataract surgery, like suturing lenses, uh, you want to go with a larger size. So, uh, um, but here, you know, you, you you got the key is to get good exposure, like like not just in ophthalmology, but in general surgery. Uh, exposure is one of the uh, in the principles of um, a surgical intervention, just like sterility exposure things that are needed for a successful surgery and uh, once we get a rexis then we can just take the cataract on a on the way we we normally do this is just to remind that in these patients a lot of these patients are immunosuppressed so if you have any question that your wound is not closing well just put a suture you're never going to regret uh, uh, doing that and um, the intraocular lens, um, there's not a lot of data. Uh, there is a good uh, review paper uh, from Dr. Um, Alio in Spain uh, that shows that acrylic foldable lenses by far are the best um, for patients with uveitis. Uh, so yeah, try not to use uh, silicone lenses in these patients, especially if they have retinal pathology. Your, uh, your retina colleagues will appreciate that. Um, and so, as we move uh, forward, uh, I'm going to start showing different scenarios of um, inflammatory conditions. Actually, this patient is this is a patient um, uh, family is originally from Brazil. They live in Florida now, and he developed a very severe case of toxo uh, and developed this um, white um, white cataract. And uh, some of these white cataracts, you know, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, you just want to make sure that you don't 
uh, developed the Argentina flag sign, but in in younger patients, I think this patient was in their 20s, uh, you can have a very aggressive inflammatory response and these capsules can become very fibrotic. So here, you know, my fellow is trying to get the rexes and is unable to get the rexes. And you can see it's uh, blurry there because uh, he accommodates more than me. Uh, but now that I'm doing it, I cannot get it myself. And it's really hard, uh, but we finally were able to tear the capsule uh, to do a rexis, but even if, once we do the rexis, we still have a fibrotic plaque. Um, so when you see these patients, like you got, you you have to think that it may be that the cataract completely liquefied, and you have posterior against anterior capsule, and there's nothing there. So you want to be very careful uh, because you may just poke and the rebitures on the other side. Uh, these cataracts are rare, but uh, I I've seen it. In this case, we were able to break the fibrotic plaque and um, um, we cut the we cut the uh, capsule with scissors. Um, this is uh, uh, we was operating one of the satellite clinics. Uh, we didn't have uh, intraocular retinal scissors, but that's what I would done. I would have done if I was in the main campus. Um, but we were able to um, get access. The cataract part is very easy because it's very soft. We basically aspirate. And you, this this rexus is not going to run because of how fibrotic it is. So we could put a lens inside the eye. So we put a, um, you can see here, we're putting a, uh, a one piece acrylic lens in the back. And uh, and this patient, especially is a blue eye patient, uh, you want to make sure that you deal with the pupil because um, with that big pupil, he's going to have a lot of glare and, and going to be uncomfortable. So you want to make sure you try to um, uh, fix the fix the pupil. So uh, there's other, um, the femtosecond laser uh, for cataract for cataract surgery is something that I am not personally a very big fan, but I have my own reasons. Uh, I don't have anything against it, but uh, there are specific scenarios uh, like here on a traumatic cataract. Uh, I think it does help in very dense traumatic cataracts to help you do a rexis. And, uh, and this patient had like two, three clock hours of sonular uh, deficiency there and uh, it helps to do a capsular rexus. So here we're putting a, um, uh, um, I'll, I'll show this case because I had a complication here. Uh, and so the rest, is, so they, there is sonular deficiency in this part and I'm putting a capsular tension ring and I should have done it the other way. And you can see as I'm injecting, I, I lost the rest of the sonular. I thought I perforated the, cap, the capsule. Um, so things that you should do is not just remain calm and uh, put viscoelastic and once we put the viscoelastic we realize that the capsule is still intact uh, it's just that the sonules gave up and um, so what I'm doing here is I'm putting um, there's a little bit of uh, vitreous hemorrhage from the from the incision uh, but we're putting a um, we're putting a a uh, it's called a Amex segment from Dr. Ahmed uh, and this Ahmed segment is going in with a Gore-Tex suture and that way it's going to give the Amex segment is right here. You tie it and uh, once the capsule is stable, then you can uh, you can inject a three piece lens either inside the bag or in the sulcus and capture it. And you can uh, keep the keep the lens very well uh, center. Uh, and you can see this is a month uh, a month out. The vitreous hemorrhage is resolved in the patient now. This is one of the first times I use Gore-Tex suture. Sometimes it's really hard to um, to bury that knot, and it's important that you do because if not, you're going to have this. And, and so far, this patient hasn't had any problems, but it can be uncomfortable when you have that uh, knot that's right there. You have, have once we complete the cataract surgery, you need to have zero tolerance for inflammation. So you have to um, uh, treat the inflammation uh, and kind of like. Uh, see if the inflammation that you've seen in the post period is what you expected. Um, so if you feel the case went well and there's significant amount of inflammation, something may be wrong and you have to act and fast. So you need to have zero tolerance to inflammation in the post period and um, you need to, uh, you know, you need to move on. If, 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 if you're treating with a lot of steroids and it's still not getting better, then you have to use other tools uh, to control the inflammation and think about other possibilities. For example, this is a patient that had straightforward cataract surgery. Uh, 
post-op day one, uh, patient's happy, surgeon is happy, and um, there was no nothing abnormal with this patient before, no uveitis, nothing. Uh, but then patient comes back with chronic iritis after cataract surgery. So when you have patients with post-op uh, inflammation after cataract surgery, things that you have to consider is one, you want to make sure that your lens is inside the capsular bag. Maybe one of the haptics is not in the bag and is rubbing on the iris. So that's kind of like an out syndrome. Or maybe you, you felt you put it in the bag, but it but you didn't put it in the bag and it's, feeding, it's in the sulcus. And uh, so you have to rule out uh, out syndrome. You have to rule out that you have a piece of the lens, of uh, the crystalline lens in the uh, in the angle. And, um, and then uh, if not, you got to think of other things. Like this patient ended up having a... Uh, um, have a, a, a syphilitic uveitis. So you did a uveitic workup in this patient. It was uh, syphilitic uh, FDA ABS positive. And then uh, um, uh, we treated with, you know, penicillin and with the use of infectious disease and it got better. Now, going back to the femtosecond laser, um, I was saying that I'm not a very big fan, but there are some situations that I do use it. Um, especially because I do a lot of cataract surgery for our uveitis service. And Dr. Janet Davis is a world expert in retinitis, and she gets a lot of patients with necrotizing retinitis, most of those patients uh, from HIV. And um, these patients need silicone oil because they get uh, retinal detachments and uh, they develop, you know, white cataracts. Sometimes they're intumescent, and the worst thing you want to do is to break a capsule when the patients have oil. And for this reason, having a, a rexis, a well uh, a round, uh, uh, continuous rexis is very important. So these are one of the few cases that I will do it. This is another case of uh, syphilitic uveitis in a young patient. Uh, we see, unfortunately, a lot of that here in South Florida. Um, so we call it let it snow. So this is the first time, this is the first time in my, in my career that I did a, a capsular rexes with no lens inside the capsular bag, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so this is, you know, just like the other cataracts I show, you're gonna have a lot of adhesions, and uh, you can use your two or three paracentesis with the um, with the coagulant and the Sinsky hoax or whatever instruments you feel comfortable. And once you have exposure, we uh, we do the, you do your rexis, and in this case, uh, the whole lens was liquefied and crystallized, and all these crystals started to come out as soon as I opened the capsule, and uh, the whole cataract, you know, just came out. Uh, there was nothing inside. All these crystals came, and so what I did is I fill out the, uh, I fill out the bag with viscoelastic, with a heavy viscoelastic, like Helon 5, and, uh, and then completed my capsular rexis. And you can see that some of these uh, patients have significant membranes. There was a intracapsular membrane going from one equator to the other one that we had to cut with intraocular scissors. Uh, and but the posterior capsule remained intact, and uh, we uh, were able to put the lens in the capsular back. Now you can see how hazy the vitreous looks there. This was a patient that even though it was three four months with a quiet eye, still has hazy vitreous. Uh, retina service wanted me to do the cataract first and then they they may do a vitrectomy. These patients, uh, I recommend doing a peripheral edectomy because they can have rebound inflammation and um, uh, and cause a significant iris bone babe. Now, retina surgeons are always to the rescue for us as anterior segment surgeons, but sometimes we get the pleasure of rescuing a retina surgeon. And this is what I'm going to show you is the real this is a real corticosteroid induced cataract. This is, we know that steroids cause cataracts, but in this time, in this case, um, the patient was getting a Osirdex implant, and when they did the intravitreal injection, the patient moved, had pain, and this device was injected into the patient's lens. So the device is inside the crystalline lens and is causing a cataract just like any steroids or a foreign body will cause. And um, I actually done uh, uh, three of these cases now. Uh, and uh, this is the first time I was doing it. And I, I approach the case as I normally approach my posterior polar cataract. So I bowl, 
I bought the lens, uh, not very dense lens. I don't do hydro dissection and um, I just use very gentle parameters and uh, uh, try to keep everything uh, control. I don't use anything sharp and uh, and then uh, um, the 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 device actually the the also the implant is very easy to fake oh it's like a powder and so there's no problems getting it out so if you encounter that situation it's going to be really easy i was trying to find a hole i used a gonio lens to see if in the equator i could see a hole but there was no hole so we decided to put a one piece lens now we are um this is another case um i have an ocular surface service so i get a lot of patients with uh, complex ocular surface disorders disorders this patient had a very severe neurotrophic um, neurotrophic ulcer that eventually perforated. Um, hold on one sec. Kids were OK, so this patient actually he's um, he's a CFO of a very big company and flies all over and eventually had a perforation and decided to come here for the management. So he had a therapeutic graph. You can see it was an eccentric graph that had to do had to be done in the in the acute phase. And a uh, good thing and is that he epithelialized and uh, he wanted an optical graph, but we told him that we're not going to do that. We need at least six months of a quiet cornea before we transplant again. We wanted to put him on uh, Oxerbate, which is a new therapy that we have for neurotrophic um, neurotrophic uh, corneas uh, and to try to restore his neurotrophic component. But what happened is he developed this very hypermature cataract uh, and it's starting to affect his pressure. It's starting to become so. So he still he had this part of the angle that was closed and he was closing. We checked that with an ultrasound. So. You know, in our service, we do a lot of cataract surgery with a very difficult view. Uh, so here you want to make sure that you go really slow uh, and you try to expose um, the pupil to give access to and break the sneakia. You want to, there's a very shallow chamber, so you want to be careful. Um, and uh, you, you, you want to have a rexus that you want to work with, but the worst thing you can have in, in cases of a bad disability it's a small rexus. So you here, I am, um, I am enlarging the rexus, and uh, enlarging the rexus, and uh, now I can work with the, I can work with the um, this white uh, cataract, and you you can just use a, a technique that you like the best and take the cataract out. And if you see here, if you the, once you do this many times, sometimes you don't even need a Valugan ring or hooks. You can just use your wrist elastic and your instruments to enlarge the pupil. Uh, I like to confirm that my bag is OK when there's poor visibility. Uh, so use an endo illuminator uh, and then putting the lens. We put a lens calculating uh, as if we're going to do a transplant because that's the plan to and, and six months after the surgery if the eye continues to be quiet. So we're normally my keratometry uh, is our 45, 45, between 45 and 44 uh, for a, a keratoplasty. So, um, we do also a lot of uh, surgery on patients with cicatricial conjunctivitis. Most of the patients with ocular cicatricial pemphigo that look like this, but um, most of the time, uh, sorry, in this in this occasion, this patient had uh, orbital lymphoma with a lot of radiation with develop, and developed significant symbolophoron and limbo stem cell deficiency, as you see here. The important thing here is that you want to work with your plastic surgeon. You want to make sure that everything is quiet now, that the, that the oncological problem is under control, that this patient had an entropion. You want to repair that before the cataract surgery. And, um, and then you come to do the surgery. So this is, you know, a classic uh, uh, problem on patients with cicatricial conjunctivitis. You, you try to put your uh, speculum, but this implant will pull the eye and it's impossible. So then you have to use this um, uh, cell sutures uh, to uh, give traction to the lids and have good exposure and do and do your uh, your surgery. So this this case went uh, very well. This is the uh, this I think it was the uh, the right eye or um, nothing nothing uh, uh, difficult. And then I did the left eye, and this is a teaching um, 
point here for the residents. Uh, I got overconfident. Uh, I did the first surgery in our main campus, and I'm doing this surgery in the other eye and, and one of our satellite offices in the Palm Beach Gardens office. And we put the speculum and the symblepharons were less, and I'm starting the surgery, and I'm feeling very comfortable. In our main campus, uh, the anesthesiologist will do the peribulbar block, um, and most of my surgeries are in the main campus. So I order a peribulbar block, but I've forgotten that in this office I have to do it. So I don't, we, this patient only has sedation and intracameral anesthesia. And as I'm doing the case, you'll notice that the eye starts to prolapse and it wants to continue to prolapse. A very floppy iris, uh, very uh, atrophic iris because of the radiation. So, you know, you want to release the viscoelastic. You don't want to push that iris back forcefully. You want to make sure you're uh, controlling and getting all that viscoelastic out, but there's still a lot of positive pressure. So I'm starting to get nervous thinking maybe a, a choroidal hemorrhage or something more severe. So eventually I just, I, I ruled that out. I decide, I asked the patient, the patient's in a lot of pain. So I do a peribarbal block. The patient uh, pain gets under control. He stops the positive pressure uh, caused by the pain. And then I'm able to fit a Mulligan ring get the pupil expansion and then proceed the case without any complications. So be able to put the lens and get the modulant ring out and be done with the case. So um, to finish, I'm gonna show some examples of cataract surgery in severe corneal situations, inflammatory. And when you're doing this is you have to, um, you have to think about a pilot. So the pilots I uh, can, fly the airplane in all kinds of situations. So when they have good visibility or when they don't have good visibility, they have to trust on their equipment, on their uh, the team and everything so they, so they can land the plane. Uh, so think about the pilot that landed the plane in the Hudson in New York. Um, everything was clear. There was no, no clouds that day. So he was able to maneuver but if that day would have been very hazy or a lot of a lot of uh, poor visibility, then maybe the outcome was not going to be as good. But the reason they do this, um, the pilots, is because they have a lot of simulation. They simulate all these scenarios. So for this is why it's very important to take advantage of simulators and wet labs as you're training, so you get more comfortable in these tough cases. And you want to make sure that everything is ready in your operating room that everything that you're going to need, uh, it's available to your nurses so you're not running around. This is a very common problem in Florida. We see a lot of fungal keratitis. This is a fusarium keratitis on a patient with recurrent HSV. They got super infected and eventually, uh, I personally don't like to do corneal transplantation in younger patients, so I let the scars settle. I use topical steroids and try to get the scars to uh, fade off, especially in younger patients with time, they, they get better. This patient developed a UVA cataract from the inflammation and had an anterior subcapsular cataract. So this is another example of using the endoilluminator um, to uh, complete the cataract surgery. You see the opacity is right here, and uh, the endoilluminator can help you localize that uh, the cortex that's under that scar that's hard to see, and you can localize it and, and complete your surgery. So. Uh, a scar that looked like this, if you're patient enough, wait, uh, not jump into a DALC or a PK, a penetrating keratoplasty, you can hold on and the scar will start continuing to improve. And just with uh, uh, scleral lenses or RGP lenses, the patient can uh, can have a decent vision. This patient works in construction, doesn't have very good insurance, so uh, doing a corneal transplantation would not be good for him. This is a patient with limbo stem cell deficiency from chronic cardioconjunctivitis from an allergic disease. And as you see here, uh, I call this the mission impossible because it was a um, um, very, very dense cataract. This patient was in her 50s, been using steroids for a long time, had a mature cataract. And uh, again, we're using the endoluminator. You can see how dense the cataract is. And as I'm proceeding with my chopping, I like to use horizontal chopping for this patient. Um, I'm feeling that something is not behaving correctly. I look and finally there is. I got a hole in the capsule and um, don't, don't panic. So use viscoelastic and uh, I, I like to um, enlarge the wound 
um, put my three-piece lens. I know I noticed there was no vitreous loss. There was no vitreous in the uh, coming a uh, significant amount. And um, I put the lens in the correct position. And then um, I like to use a uh, pars plana. Um, I, I like to do a pars plana uh, uh, incision for my for my anterior vitrector with an infusion in the anterior chamber. That way I can control the vitreous prolapse uh, better. Uh, and then to finish, I'll show you a couple of videos of uh, radiation cataracts. Uh, uh, this this patient's behaved like a uveitic cataract with IFIS. Um, we see a lot of melanoma uh, because we have a very busy oncology service. And this is a patient that had a ciliary body melanoma. You can see how big the tumor was in the ciliary body. Had radiation right on the lens, developed a white cataract. And the reason I want to show you this video is because if you ever encounter this situation, of a white cataract secondary to a melanoma. If that melanoma is very close, like in the serial body, um, once you're doing the cataract surgery, like I'm doing here, a like cataract just goes as, as planned, I'm doing it. And I, at some point I felt that this was part of the cataract and a phaco, and it was a tumor. A tumor can look like this when they're getting necrotic after the radiation. So I felt that I put a hole in the capsule uh, and uh, I decide to, um, I decided to put a three-piece lens. I was not 100% uh, sure my capsule was intact, so I put a three-piece lens. I capsule, I captured with the anterior capsule. The lens is pretty stable. I shrink the pupil to make sure there's no vitreous, uh, and uh, and then uh, everything is okay. So this is another uh, common scenario on patients with the um, with limbal stem cell deficiency. With limbal stem cell deficiency from uh, um, uh, from radiation. Um, give me one second. And uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to use my cell, uh, my cell phone. So this is a this is a patient that had uh, patient had a metastatic disease from a uh, leiomyosarcoma in the uterus, and they went to the retina and had eight sessions of radiation. Uh, and developed stem cell deficiency, and a surgeon did the technique of SLED, and actually uh, the cornea became much more clear. And this opacity that you see here is retained amniotic membrane. So they asked, they sent it to me to do a, a DALC or a penetrating keratoplasty, uh, but this is just amniotic membrane you can confirm with uh, with OCT. And so in this cases, you're not looking for the 2020 um, the keratometry. Uh, can have you can use the other eye keratometry, and what more important here is that the retina specialist uh, can see the posterior segment. So, uh, sorry for the volume. Uh, the the here, you can do the surgery just like we've been showing. Uh, this cataracts for post radiations are pretty dense, and they can be hard. So use your your technique that you feel more comfortable. I like to use again horizontal chopping, and you can. I mean, every quadrant, I try to fill the eye with viscoelastic. I uh, like to use um, a dispersive viscoelastic to protect the endothelium. And then at the end, you get a nice red reflex and the retina surgeon can, uh, or the oncologist can examine the posterior segment. So um, I think uh, I'm gonna skip the radiation lecture. I, I wanna, uh, all of these videos are available on my YouTube channel. Uh, you just type a mesqua ocular surface and you can uh, use the YouTube uh, videos. Uh, and um, I think it's very important to, um, especially with uveitic patients, to really explain them well how you're going to do the, the treatment because uh, you'll be surprised how patients put their drops or don't put their drops. And this is a good example of uh, good communication or bad communication with the patient. And can you pause here? Is, um, Dr. House is uh, asking how is she using her inhaler for her asthma, and she says she's been using it as, as he prescribed, and he says, this, are you sure? And he, she, uh, she, she responds saying, I, uh, do you think I'm an idiot? And he says, why don't you show me how do you use the inhaler? So then she uses the inhaler. So it's very important to go over the drops or the medications, uh, the pills, if you're going to use prednisone, 
uh, because uh, delay in treatment can cause significant rebound inflammation in these patients, and you can get a lot of adhesions within the iris and the anterior capsule. And, you know, you can get iris bone bay and things like that, cystoid macular edema, et cetera. So with this, I will uh, finish. Uh, you all have a house here in, uh, in Miami, and if, uh, if anything that you need from uh, Vascon Palmer Institute, uh, uh, feel free to let me, let me know. And obrigado. Okay. Any questions? Feel free to let me know. Oh, thank you, thank you for your presentation, uh, Guillermo. It's magnificent. Um, it's a really out outstanding videos. Uh, fantastic. I, 